All right, I think it's it's time to begin. So I'd like to welcome you to our panel today on uh, the future of Smith and religious exceptions. I was told to let everybody know that uh, a little correction to a previous announcement, you're supposed to pick up your lunch in the hall, uh, so, so just an FYI. So my name is James Phillips. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of law at Chapman University's Fowler School of Law, and I'll be moderating the panel today. Uh, I'm just going to start off with the briefest uh, of introductions, which is basically their title. Um, and then you can read about our, our panelists' backgrounds uh, in your program. Uh, and then I've been asked to give just a little bit of a brief background, and then we'll turn it over uh, to our panelists. And, and if we have time, we'll be happy to take questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, just by a show of hands, um, how many here are willing to publicly admit that they're attorneys? I'm just curious what our numbers are. Okay, all right, so most of you have come to the dark side. Good to know. Um, uh, our first uh, uh, panelist today will be uh, Professor Mark Mosesian. He's the Frederick A. Whitney Professor of Contract Law at St. John's uh, Law School in New York, and also their, uh, uh, the director of their Center for Law and Religion. Our next panelist will be Professor Fred Geddix. He is the Guy Anderson Chair and Professor of Law here at BYU's J. Reuben Clark uh, Law School. Uh, and our third panelist will be Mr. Gene Scher. He's the principal and founding partner of the uh, law firm Scher Jaffe and is a senior fellow with the International Center for Law and Religion. So just a little bit of background before we turn over to our panelists, uh, although uh, most of you probably know this. Um, from 1963 to 1990, the Supreme Court was operating under a certain framework for handling religious uh, uh, free exercise claims. Uh, that was a framework that lawyers referred to as strict scrutiny, uh, more or less. Um, wherein if, if a religious claimant was, re, ha, was substantially burdened in their free exercise, uh, the government could only uh, um, uh, burden that uh, claimant if they had a compelling government interest and if uh, the, uh, that interest was achieved through the least restrictive way possible. In 1990, uh, Employment Division versus Smith came out, a majority decision written by Justice Scalia, uh, and it uh, added to that framework somewhat uh, with uh, a new wrinkle. Um, and that wrinkle was that if a law was considered to be neutral to religion and generally applicable, uh, then we didn't worry uh, about compelling interest or least restrictive means or, or substantial burdens. It, it just the law was, was constitutional. Um, uh, and this was a, a bit controversial, to, to say the least, at the time. Um, in fact, just to give you an idea of, of the almost uh, universal condemnation at the time, um, uh, in response, Congress passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, to try to put back into at least statutory law uh, the pre-Smith uh, uh, framework. And uh, that passed the House unanimously and passed the Senate 97 to 3 and then was signed into law by President Clinton. Imagine something like that happening today. Um, and you had some strange bedfellows who were criticizing Smith. You had statements from the ACLU and the Baptist Joint Committee calling it, uh, quote, the Dred Scott of the First Amendment. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a figure familiar to probably many in this audience, uh, then Elder Dallin H. Oaks uh, testified before Congress uh, and said that uh, Smith would lead to the degradation of religious freedom. Now, after 32 years uh, of time passing, something interesting has happened. On the one hand, the criticism of Smith uh, in some ways has grown to include additional criticisms like that it's unworkable uh, or a criticism that President Oaks leveled last uh, November that it, Smith appears to have perpetuated, if not exacerbated, the decisiveness in our relationships. But on the other hand, the number of defenders of Smith has also grown, uh, such that um, there, you know, there are um, many more folks who see Smith as actually uh, a pretty good uh, framework for uh, our current uh, free exercise uh, issues. Uh, and I think our panel is going to reflect some of that diversity of thought today. So with that, uh, I, let's turn it over to uh, Professor Mosesian. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference, and I'd like my I'd like to thank my panelists too. Fred and I know each other for some time in the business. I'm glad to meet James and Jean. Thank you very much for having me. So, uh, in my talk, I'd like to focus on three points. First, I'm going to give some general background on religious exemptions under the Free Exercise Clause of the U.S. Constitution, what they are, why they're so controversial. I'm not going to discuss statutory provisions. James mentioned RIFRA. I'm not going to talk about that or state constitutional law. That's number one. Next, I'll give a little more background on Employment Division versus Smith, which is the landmark Supreme Court decision that James was just mentioning, decided 32 years ago. Uh, it's thought to limit the possibilities for religious exemptions under the Free Exercise Clause. It's been controversial from the start. Uh, and as James said, there have been frequent calls for the court to overturn Smith. And the third thing I'll talk about is the status of Smith after the Supreme Court's decision last term in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. In, in that case, it looked like the court might be ready to overrule Smith and expand the possibility for religious exemptions, but um, the former didn't happen. The latter may have. Um, as I'll explain, Smith remains the law, but the court may have changed the practical effect of the Smith rule and expanded the possibility of religious exemptions. I think Fred is going to talk more about Fulton after, after I'm done. Okay, number one, religious exemptions under the Free Exercise Clause. The Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment provides that government may not prohibit the free exercise of religion. That clause covers not only belief, but also conduct. Uh, and that makes sense, because for most people, religion means conduct, not just belief. Religions typically require people to act in certain ways or not to act in certain ways, not just to believe certain things. Now, that presents a dilemma. What if the civil law prohibits conduct that someone's religion requires or requires conduct that someone's religion forbids? Should the person have an exemption from the law? Now, government can't simply allow people to ignore the law because they say their religion requires them to do so. That would promote chaos, especially in a country as religiously pluralist as the US. On the other hand, if the government doesn't allow at least some exemptions or accommodations for religious reasons, then the protections of the free exercise clause would be rather trivial. So the question is, to what extent does the Free Exercise Clause require the state to grant exemptions from civil law for religiously motivated conduct? Down the centuries, the court has adopted different approaches about, uh, uh, well, I'll get to what James said in a second. About 30 years ago, in a case called Employment Division versus Smith, the court announced a rather restrictive test. Uh, Smith remains the law today, although as I said, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit, the court has arguably weakened that holding. Okay, so that gets, that gets me to my second point, employment division versus Smith. There are many ways to characterize the Smith decision, but I think of Smith, at least myself, as the Smith rule as containing two different elements. First element, or first part, even where a law interferes with the exercise of religion, the free exercise clause does not require religious exemptions if the law is neutral and generally applicable. Okay? Neutral and generally applicable. What do those terms mean? Neutral refers to the idea that the law is not motivated by hostility to religion or to specific religious groups. Right? So the state was not targeting religion for disfavored treatment. That's what neutral means. Generally applicable, that concept is less clear, but it's generally thought that generally applicable refers to the idea that a law applies to a category of conduct across the board, whether or not that conduct is religiously motivated. So for example, let's say a police department has a rule that police officers cannot wear beards, except for medical reasons, because you know some skin conditions make it inadvisable for, for men to shave. Okay, so no beards except for medical reasons. Arguably, that's not a generally applicable rule because police officers may wear beards for some purposes, right? So not generally applicable. That's just an example. Okay, part one. If a law is neutral and generally applicable, uh, accommodations are not required. The second part of the Smith rule states that if the law in question is not neutral and generally applicable, 
then the free exercise clause may require religious exemptions. It'll depend on whether the law in question can survive the test that James mentioned called strict scrutiny. And strict scrutiny means the state must have a compelling reason to enforce the law against the person who claims an exemption and must have chosen the least restrictive means for doing so. Now before Smith, as James said, that was the test that applied generally. Smith limited the application of strict scrutiny, which is why I say Smith adopted a restrictive view of religious exemptions. The court hoped that Smith would promote predictability and even-handedness in religious exemption cases, but the decision was controversial from the start. Uh, many religious organizations thought that the case was too restrictive and that strict scrutiny should apply more frequently. And with respect to predictability, Smith turned out to contain several lurking ambiguities that courts and commentators have been debating for a generation now. Okay, that leads to my third point, this case called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. Over the last three decades, people have repeatedly called for the court to reconsider Smith. And last term, it looked like the court might actually do it. The court granted certiorari in a case called Fulton uh, versus City of Philadelphia precisely on the question whether the court should overrule Smith and apply strict scrutiny more generally. Some of, the justices had, has, I'm sorry, some of the justices had hinted that they were ready to do so. And that's what many commentators expected. In the end, though, the court did not overrule Smith. OK, what's Fulton about? Fulton addressed whether the city of Philadelphia could require Catholic social services and adoption agency to place children with same-sex couples as a condition of participating in the city's foster care system. From religious conviction, CSS does not place children with same-sex couples or, for that matter, with unmarried opposite-sex couples. In 2018, the city notified CSS that it would no longer refer children to the agency unless, CS, unless C C CSS agreed to do so. The city maintained that CSS's conduct violated both city law and a non-discrimination clause in the contract that CSS had with the city. CSS requested a religious exemption, but the city said that its rule against discrimination applied across the board to all adoption agencies, religiously affiliated and non-religiously affiliated. The rule was thus, remember what I said before? The rule was thus neutral and generally applicable under Smith, and therefore no exemption for CSS was required. The court took the case, and as I say, one of the questions the court agreed to hear was whether Smith should be overturned. In the end, though, the court decided it wasn't necessary to reconsider Smith because Philadelphia's anti-discrimination policy was unconstitutional even under Smith. Why? Because the court said Philadelphia's contract with CSS, as well as with other adoption agencies, allowed for the possibility of an exception. The contract stated that the anti-discrimination rule applied, quote, unless an exception is granted by the commissioner in his or her sole discretion. Now, I gotta tell you, that was a contestable interpretation of the contract. Uh, in fact, none of the parties in the case had even raised that issue. The city had never made an exception to its anti-discrimination policy and obviously did not intend to do so. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court said the mere possibility of an exception, theoretically speaking, was enough to make Philadelphia's rule non-generally applicable and thus to trigger strict scrutiny under Smith. And under strict scrutiny, the, city, the court held, the city had failed to show a compelling interest in holding CSS to its non-discrimination policy. The court conceded that the city had a strong interest in promoting equal treatment of prospective foster parents. The court said it was a weighty interest, quote unquote. But that interest did not justify denying an exemption to CSS, in particular, when exceptions were theoretically available to others. Now, the ruling was unanimous, um, although there wasn't a unanimous opinion for the court. The court's opinion was written by Chief Justice Roberts. Um, it got six votes. Justice Alito, joined by Justices Thomas and Gorsuch, filed a lengthy concurrence in the case arguing that the court should have taken the opportunity to overrule Smith once and for all. But that only got three votes. That was not a majority. So after Fulton, Smith remains on the books. 
Nonetheless, and I'm getting to my final point, it's not clear what remains of the Smith test. If it's true, as Fulton suggests, that even a theoretical possibility of an exception triggers strict scrutiny, well then Smith doesn't pose much of a limitation on religious accommodations. As every first year law student learns, exceptions exist for every rule. It's practically impossible to imagine a law that admits the possibility of absolutely no exception at all, even theoretically. Moreover, if the mere theoretical possibility of an exception means that a state lacks a compelling interest in applying its rule to any particular litigant, it's hard to envision a religious claimant ever losing a religious accommodations case. So, even though Smith formally remains good law, its attempt to limit religious accommodations seems now to have failed. Okay, that's one reading of Fulton. If that reading of Fulton is right, then religious believers and groups can take comfort. It's going to be much easier to obtain religious accommodations going forward. Now that may be good or bad, as I say, depending on what your view of, of that is. But in closing, I think a caveat is necessary. Um, as anyone who studies the, the, the doctrine knows, the court's religion clause jurisprudence is notoriously unpredictable. The justices often seem not to feel bound by the logic of what they've said in previous cases. Um, the court might not feel the need to stick to Fulton's reasoning in the future. Moreover, as I, as I indicated, the court went out of its way to find an exception in Fulton. Remember, none of the parties had even raised the issue that there was an exception in the case. Um, perhaps because the court did not want to resolve definitively the particular conflict that case presented between religious freedom and the rights of LGBT citizens. The court might not feel that way about other, con uh, other contexts, uh, and might find a way to limit Fulton to its facts. We'll just have to wait and see. So I'll leave it there. Perhaps we can talk some more in the Q&A, and I think Professor Geddix is going to talk more about Fulton now. Thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, first thank the center and uh, my colleague Elizabeth Clark for the invitation to participate on this panel and to do so with uh, Mark and James and Jean, who've all done important work on uh, issues of religious freedom and constitutional law. Um, when I first thought of uh, formulating my, my remarks, I considered whether uh, Smith had entered the ranks of uh, undead zombie-like decisions like Lemon versus Kurtzman. Those of you who are familiar with this area know that the Lemon Test has, has been around for 50 years. Its demise has been predicted for half that, long, that length of time at least, and yet it's still around. The court largely ignores it, but every once in a while it will surface. Um, but uh, I decided instead to focus on uh, Justice Barrett's uh, concurring opinion, very short concurring opinion in Fulton. A as Mark indicated, uh, uh, three conservative justices uh, would abandon Smith altogether and return to strict scrutiny of incidental burdens on uh, religious activity that prevailed from 1963 to 1990. Um, Justice B Justices Barrett and Kavanaugh also criticized Smith um, in a short concurring opinion as I indicated Barrett observed that as a matter of text and structure it is difficult to see why the free exercise clause alone among First Amendment freedoms offers nothing more than protection from discrimination so she and Justice Kavanaugh are wary of exchanging the categorical Smith rule for the categorical rule of strict scrutiny, uh, fearing that this would just trade one set of problems for another set of problems. Uh, so they announce their preference for a regime of nuanced interest balancing like the doctrines they say, like the doctrines that govern other First Amendment freedoms. So the future of Smith seems to lie with Barrett and Kavanaugh. And if that's where it lies, I think uh, we ought to correct 
their misunderstanding, which I think is widely shared, that Smith is doctrinally anomalous, that it provides less protection for the free exercise of religion than the court affords to other First Amendment freedoms. I think that's wrong. In fact, Smith closely tracks the doctrine of other First Amendment freedoms with respect to incidental burdens. So this is this has nothing to do with targeted burdens, uh, burdens that the court imposes only on religious activities, but rather burdens that incidentally uh, affect uh, religious activity along with um, uh, the activities of other citizens. Uh, in short, uh, the free exercise of religion is already protected uh, from incidental burdens of general laws to the same extent or nearly the same extent as other First Amendment rights. So we can start with a First Amendment right that uh, Justice Barrett did not mention, freedom of the press. Uh, as you can see from the handout, um, the text of the freedom of the press uh, of the press clause is virtually identical to the text of the free exercise clause. Uh, the court has consistently held that the press clause does not exempt newspapers or reporters uh, from the incidental burdens of generally applicable laws. So reporters are required to um, give information to criminal investigators, including the identities of their sources, uh, uh, when those investigators are, um, are prosecuting crimes. But the court has applied the freedom of impress to invalidate laws that single out the press for special burdens. So uh, attacks on newsprint is unconstitutional. Uh, for those of you youngsters, uh, newsprint is a special papers, it's a special paper that newspapers were printed on when they used to be actually printed. So that clearly was uh, a tax that was targeted at newspapers. So the press is protected from discriminatory burdens on news reporting and publication, but not from the incidental burdens on those activities from general laws that also bind all other ordinary citizens. This perfectly tracks a doctrinal set, a structure set up by Smith. Uh, which protects believers from laws that target their religious practices, but not from the incidental burdens of laws that apply to everyone else. Uh, Justice Barrett's primary example of Smith's purportedly anomalous character is the freedom of speech. Uh, but the speech clause deals with uh, conduct regu regulations that incidentally burden speech and expression in much the same way that Smith deals with incidental burdens on religious exercise. Le the leading case is United States o uh, versus O'Brien. That's also on the handout. Uh, a young man had burned his draft card on the steps of the federal courthouse in Boston, I believe, uh, to protest the Vietnam War, uh, which was fought, as again, uh, us oldsters know, primarily with draftees. Um, this draft card burning, though it was not literally speech, the young man was not talking as he did this, but it was unquestionably expressive conduct protected by the speech clause, as the handout explains. Uh, nevertheless, he was convicted of violating a federal law which criminalized the destruction of one's draft card. To decide the case, the court announced a test for measuring the constitutionality of laws that burden expressive conduct. Uh, those laws are constitutional if they further an important or substantial government interest. Uh, they are unrelated to the suppression of free expression. And the burden of the law is no greater than is essential to the furtherance of that interest. Now that test sounds pretty protective of expressive conduct, but in practice it's not. Um, to be sure, the court regularly invalidates regulations under O'Brien when they target expressive conduct, just as it routinely invalidates regulations that target religious practices under the free exercise clause and under the press clause that are targeted at religious exercise and news reporting. Uh, the court, however, won't look very hard for a constitutionally illegitimate purpose when it's reviewing a law that burdens expressive conduct. 
if, uh, if the illegitimate purpose doesn't appear on the face of the statute, then it's all good as far as the court is concerned. Moreover, the court can, uh, understands an important or substantial government interest, sort of oxymoronically or paradoxically, as one that is simply non-trivial and legitimate. Finally, it requires an alternative to be equally as effective as the burdensome law, not nearly as effective, which is normally how the less restrictive alternative uh, prong is applied. So if exempting expressive conduct from a governmental burden would degrade the government's ability to achieve its goal even a tiny bit, it's not a less restrictive alternative, even if the expressive conduct is wholly suppressed as a result. So O'Brien itself illustrates the toothlessness of this test. Uh, the legislative history of the draft card law is full of congressional outrage at hippies who were burning their draft cards. And it was fairly clear that the law uh, prohibiting the destruction of draft cards was aimed at this behavior. But that purpose did not appear on the face of the statute, and so the court simply refused to acknowledge it. Uh, requiring draft age men to carry their registration cards in person really didn't make it any easier to catch draft dodgers, uh, even in the pre-digital era. Um, draft registration records were held in a central location where any person's draft status could be easily and relatively quickly verified. And of course, any prosecution of draft evasion would rely on those records and not this little card that people did or did not carry around with them. Nevertheless, because it was conceivable that in some unspecified situation, verifying draft status uh, via centralized records might not be equally as effective as asking to see someone's draft card, and because quick identification of draft evaders is a non-trivial and legitimate government goal, the court held that the law against destroying one's draft card satisfied O'Brien, and it upheld the criminal conviction. So you'll not be surprised to learn that in the years since the court has decided O'Brien in 1968, it has invalidated only two or three uh, regulations that incidentally burdened expressive conduct. Now, two or three is more than zero, which is the number of incidental burdens on religion that the court has invalidated under Smith in the 32 years of its existence. So protecting religious exercise from incidental burdens in the same way that it protects uh, expressive conduct is not quite a nothing burger, but it is almost a nothing burger. Um, it's certainly less of a burger than the cheapest one you can buy at McDonald's. <clears throat> So if Barris and Kavanaugh's goal is to equalize protection of religious exercise with protection of speech and the press, um, that pretty much already exists. If the court were to overrule Smith and adopt a meaningful scrutiny of incidental burdens on religion, however nuanced that doctrinal regime would be, it would install greater protection of religious exercise than is currently afforded to other First Amendment rights. That would please, I think, many religious conservatives, but it would come at the cost of equality of citizenship. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Let me also thank, uh, thank the Center for the opportunity to speak to all of you today, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be a uh, on a panel with such distinguished scholars. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Phillips uh, omitted what to me is, uh, is the most important aspect of my current uh, career path, which is uh, uh, in addition to the things he mentioned, being a practicing lawyer and being, on the, uh, being a senior fellow for the center, I also have the privilege of teaching as an adjunct professor at the law school. And so like Fred, I have the opportunity of, uh, of teaching some of the most uh, some of the smartest law students anywhere in the country, and I, I teach a course on, uh, I, I teach the Supreme Court Clinic at the law school, and I also teach a course on religious liberty advocacy, which is great fun, thanks to the students. Um, it makes the weekly trips from Washington, D.C. Uh, enjoyable, and something I look forward to. Um, I, uh, I'd like to begin with a, a personal story involving Smith. Um, I had the privilege of, 
of clerking on the Supreme Court for Justice Scalia um, during the term just before the first, the first Smith case. Now, uh, I know most of you are lawyers. You may not realize that Smith was actually before the court twice. Um, and, uh, and the first time the case came before the court was in, it was in uh, I think it was 1986 or probably 1987 when I was clerking there and I was a member, Denise Lindbergh is here and she had the same experience as well. Uh, we were members of, as, as Supreme Court clerks, we were members of what is called the CERT pool. And that's a group of, of clerks who, who, whom the justices sort of pool together to revu review all of the petitions for review that come before the Supreme Court so that so as to kind of share the burden of deciding which cases are going to get a very serious look um, by all the justices and so I you know just at random I was assigned to review the the first Smith cert petition um, and so I, I, I reviewed it with some care and, and, and I concluded that it was probably not a good candidate for the Supreme Court's review. First of all, the court didn't have jurisdiction over the case at all under the statute that, that governs the Supreme, court, the Supreme Court review because the decision wasn't yet final in the, Oregon, uh, in the Oregon courts and there's a statute that precludes the Supreme Court's review in that circumstance and, and, and it also wasn't clear that uh, that using peyote, especially in a, in a religious ceremony, which was the facts at, at issue in, in Smith, it wasn't clear that that was really a violation of Oregon's criminal law. Uh, and of course, I, I knew the court had been looking for a case, or some of the justices had been looking for a case where they could consider adopting a rule like Smith, but this just didn't seem uh, to be a very good candidate for that. Uh, so I recommended the court deny deny cert, but they granted cert over my <laughs> over my recommendation. Um, they they had full briefing, they had oral argument, and lo and behold, after oral argument, they decided, in, in its present posture, this is really not a very good case for us <laughs> to decide this issue, and so they vacated the the Oregon Supreme Court's decision and sent it back. Uh, and, and posed to them very starkly the question of, you know, does, does this conduct that's at issue here violate Oregon criminal law? And they also, without acknowledging their first error, they, they gave the Oregon Supreme Court an opportunity to actually issue what was, the, what, what was then a final decision and over which they would have jurisdiction. Um, and then, of course, uh, the case came, came back up on another, on another cert petition, and they granted that one as well. And, and then uh, Justice Scalia wrote the opinion in 1990 that, uh, that we're talking about today. Now, um, and his decision uh, was, only one of, was one of only a very uh, a handful in which I, uh, I disagreed with him and, and it was uh, disappointing uh, to me and to a lot of other people that he, that he would write that opinion. But on the, on the positive side, in my view at least, he spent the rest of his career on the U.S. Supreme Court atoning for that decision. <laughs> in fact, you know, for, um, he, and, in, and more specifically, he voted to sustain the religious liberty claim in every subsequent case that came before him as a Supreme Court justice, with one exception, which was the city of Bernie case, which involved the attempt by, Con the, it, it involved RIFRA, but, uh, but Congress in RIFRA had basically attempted to uh, reverse the, the Smith decision as to the states as well as the federal government and the Supreme Court, the majority of the Supreme Court held in the city of Bernie case, well, yeah, you can do that as to, the, as, as to the federal government, but you don't have the authority to impose your view of the free exercise clause on the states, notwithstanding our view that it's narrower than you, <laughs> than you might like it to be. And so that was the only other case uh, in his career in which Justice Scalia ruled against uh, a religious liberty claim in a case, a, a case that came before him on the merits, at least that I'm aware of. There were well over 25 cases uh, that, he, that he sat on then. Um, and so my, uh, uh, my first professional mentor after leaving the Supreme Court was, was the founding dean of the law school, Rex Lee. Uh, who had been a good friend of mine from my undergraduate days here, and he uh, um, he he called me up while I was still while while I was still at the court, and uh, many of you in the room probably 
know him, and, and, and if you remember him, he, he had kind of a duck-like voice. And, uh, and I picked up the phone when he called, and he said, hello, Gene, um, I want to hire you. And, uh, and so we ended up, uh, I ended up going to work for him uh, at, at his new law firm, Sidley Austin, where he, where he had begun a new appellate practice. And Denise later joined us in that practice and several other uh, stellar people. And, uh, but he had his, his first rule in dealing with the Supreme Court is that you had to be a mathematician of sorts, uh, but a very peculiar kind of mathematician. He said, you have to be able to count to five. <laughs> there are nine justices on the court. If you, get, if you persuade five of them, you're going to win. <laughs> and if you don't, you're going to lose, no matter how good your argument was. And, uh, and so I think as we, as we think about what the Supreme Court is likely to do with this whole Smith question and whether they're going to overrule it or modify it or whatever, uh, it's useful to kind of try to think to five, and that's, and that's something that I do all the time with my, uh, with my students here at BYU, and they've, uh, they've gotten pretty good at it uh, over the years. Um, so I have, uh, I, I'd like to do that, but in the context of, of kind of making three basic points. Uh, and the first is uh, that the court's more liberal and conservative wings have flipped in their views of Smith uh, during the time since, uh, since Smith was decided. Uh, and they flipped in such a way that those who were viewed as the more liberal justices on the court, uh, I think are likely to try to keep Smith in place, okay? Now, when Smith was in part a reaction to, uh, to what then was, was a fairly recent development in free exercise law, and that was the idea that the, uh, uh, that incidental burdens on religious exercise should be subject to strict scrutiny. That was the rule that had been adopted really by what was then the liberal wing of the, of the Supreme Court, led by, uh, led by Justice Brennan. Uh, and that was, that was the rule of uh, the, the, probably the most famous case was called Sherbert versus Warner, which, uh, which involved a guy who, who wanted an exemption from having to, you know, from having to work in the um, in the arms industry, and uh, and there was a law that said, you know, if you, uh, that if you uh, if you get fired from your job, you can't get, uh, you know, for legitimate reasons, you can't get uh, unemployment benefits. And he had been he had been fired from his job because, as I recall, he didn't want to he, he didn't want to work on munitions anymore. He had become a he had become a pacifist, and. Uh, and so, and so the Supreme Court, led by the liberal wing of the court, which was dominant on this issue, said, uh, you know, that incidental burden is subject to, to strict scrutiny, and since the government can't satisfy strict scrutiny, uh, he gets an exemption from that law. So, um, so prior to Smith, the, the more liberal justices who, who supported Sherbert and then opposed Smith they were, they tended to be sympathetic to most of the religious beliefs that required an exemption. Um, and, um, you know, and, and they also figured that the application of civil rights laws would almost always pass even strict scrutiny. There was a, there was a, a decision from the, from the mid 80s called Bob Jones University um, versus the IRS in which, uh, in which the IRS, um, threw out the tax exempt status of Bob Jones University because they had a policy against interracial dating. And, and the Supreme Court purported to apply a strict scrutiny to that decision by the IRS and held that, you know, that it passed strict scrutiny. There was a compelling governmental interest in, you know, in, in preventing racial discrimination and, and, there, and the IRS had no other alternative but to deny a tax exempt status to, to institutions who engaged in any kind of uh, racial discrimination. And so, and so the, the, the ruling against Bob Jones University was sustained under strict scrutiny. Um, so at the time, uh, the more conservative justices tended to be less sympathetic to the claims for religious exemptions that typically arose under the Sherbert regime. Um, and you know, and they, they generally had no problem supporting prohibitions on racial discrimination. It, it, you know, everybody was basically in agreement that racial, dis racial discrimination was just not going to be allowed in any form. Um, and so 
now, if you if you look at the uh, the lineup of the Supreme Court now, as uh, as has already been mentioned, there are three justices who have quite clearly said that they would like to see Smith overruled: uh, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, and Justice Gorsuch. Um, and uh, and if you look at the uh, at the sheet that I passed out, this is just a little chart that I that I update every year and, and give to my students, but it, it kind of attempts to capture in a very, maybe not a very user-friendly way, but, <laughs> but, it, but it tries to capture the position that each justice on the court, each of the current justices on the court, has taken in all of the religious liberty cases that have come, that have come before the court since, uh, since Justice Thomas joined the court. And if you, I, we're not gonna go through this in detail, but if you, if you sort of study that, study that list in, uh, uh, with care, you'll see that um, uh, that Justice Thomas and Justice Alito and uh, and Justice Gorsuch have voted in favor of the religious liberty claimant in just about every case that came before them. Justice Thomas has voted against the religious liberty claimant in, I think it's uh, three of the 28 cases that that he sat. One of the, one of those was a case in which uh, he disagreed with Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia wrote an opinion sustaining a religious liberty claim and, and Justice Thomas uh, voted against it. Um, so, but he's been, you know, over 90 percent in favor of religious liberty claims. Um, and uh, and uh, Justice Alito and Justice Gorsuch have voted in favor of the religious liberty claim in every single case. Um, that they've that they've sat on, uh, so their position in wanting to overrule rule Smith is not terribly surprising. Uh, but if you look at the uh, the Democratic appointees to the court, uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, and Kagan, you know, as you can, I didn't do this in much detail, but if you but if you look at the back of the chart, uh, you will see that Justice Sotomayor, during her career on the court, has sat on 18 cases that have raised a religious, uh, a, a religious liberty claim. She's voted in favor of that claim only five in five of the 18 cases, so a little bit less than a third. Uh, Justice Kagan has been considerably more friendly towards religious liberty claims. She's voted in favor of the claim in 18, uh, I'm sorry, in 11 of the 18 cases that have come before the court while, uh, while she's been there. But, but interestingly, um, the, the judges, the justices on that end of the spectrum tend to be, tend to be as you would expect, somewhat more concerned about, uh, uh, about sex-related issues, uh, you know, abortion, contraception, LGBT-related issues, and, and those sorts of things. And so if you look at, if you look at Justice Sotomayor, five of the 13 votes that she cast against a religious liberty claimant involved um, a sex-related or LGP, LGBT kind of issue. And for, and for Justice Kagan, uh, three of the uh, three of her votes, three of her seven votes against religious liberty claims uh, involved uh, involve that kind of a claim, and and in that regard, Fulton was kind of a surprise, right? Because it it obviously involved LGBT interests who were sort of arrayed against the religious liberty claimant, uh, and yet the court unanimously, including Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan, essentially essentially said, "Look, you know, City of Philadelphia, you're really gonna, you're really going too far here. You know, forget the the basic reasoning that they used. The the, the underlying message was you've really gone too far." In your attempt to, you know, to balance religious liberty against against LGBT interests. Um, okay. Um, so, for for that reason, I you know I would expect uh, Justice Sotomayor and, and Justice Kagan, uh, and perhaps Justice Jackson. I'm not I'm not sure where she's going to come down on these issues. Uh, my guess is that she'll probably be more aligned with either Justice Kagan or Justice Sotomayor. My guess is that she'll be more like Kagan than Sotomayor in, in her view of protecting religious liberty, uh, just, just given her own personal strong Christian beliefs. She's, uh, she spent most of her adult life as a, as, a pretty, uh, uh, as, a, as a pretty ardent follower of the Baptist faith and, and sent her children for a time to a, to a very ardent Baptist school in suburban D.C. where, where we sent one of, our, uh, one of our sons for a while. Um, and I was, uh, you know, in terms of protecting religious liberty, that, that experience on her part uh, at least gives me some hope because she's had some experience uh, 
getting to know people who are very, very devoutly uh, religious, and she at least is going to, is going to understand them. Um, so uh, I, I think it's difficult to predict uh, exactly what the court is going to do. The key, uh, if, if you look at the Chief Justice, uh, and, and those of you who follow the Supreme Court will know that the Chief Justice does not like to make major changes quickly. <laughs> He is, he is what you would call an incrementalist, and so he, and Fulton is an example of this, right? In Fulton, he found a way uh, to get six justices on, a, on an opinion that did not overrule Smith, um, right? He had the ability, I'm sure, to overrule Smith if he had wanted to, but, but he was trying to do something more limited and less stark uh, than, than overrule a, a longstanding decision from the court, and so he was, he was able to engineer um, a, a result that did not, you know, that did not end up uh, in, end up overruling Smith. Um, so, as uh, as Fred said, uh, whether Smith gets overruled in the near future is is going to be in the hands of uh, of Justice Barrett and Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, my guess is that Justice Barrett, who clerked for uh, for Justice Scalia a few years after I did is not going to be anxious to undo his handiwork. Um, uh, there, were, there were people who hoped that, that Justice Scalia might ultimately decide that Smith was a mistake. But, people who <laughs> but, but in fact, he, he defended Smith to the, uh, to the very end, and I think Justice, uh, Justice Barrett, is, as his former law clerk, is going to be reluctant to be the justice who sort of makes the decision that we're going to, that we're going to throw this out. So my best guess is that we're likely to see more temporizing on the court on, on this issue for some time to come until, until Justice, uh, uh, Justice Barrett and or, uh, and or Justice Kavanaugh and perhaps others decide the time, you know, the time is now right to, to jettison Smith altogether. Look forward to any questions you've got. Uh, Nathaniel Hurd from the Religious Freedom Institute. Uh, a question about uh, language and its cultural implications. Uh, with the sort of shift in public attitudes about uh, religion and, and religious people moving in a more uh, secular uh, direction, uh, I want to zero in on the language of, ex of exemption versus the language of protection and ask in the view of the panelists whether you think that there is a, uh, a cultural cost of using the language of, of exemption rather than protection. And, and, and underpinning this is the following. There are some who look at religious people who are asking for what some call protections or what others call exemptions uh, as asking for uh, me individually or us corporately to indulge some uh, irrational, quirky religious belief uh, that has zero implications uh, for the common good. Uh, and the language of exemptions, one might argue, might reinforce that view. So I'm wondering if the panels could sort of comment on um, whether or not we should continue to use the language of exemption, whether protection uh, might be uh, better, uh, but specifically hinged to uh, its cultural implications and how people view religious freedom. Thank you. I think it depends on the context, right? If you, if you look at a law like RIFRA, I think it's fair to, to call RIFRA a, you know, a general kind of protection for religious liberty. Uh, and yet, in individual cases, um, the, the effect of RIFRA is to create a, a religious exemption, at least for, you know, for the particular person who successfully invokes RIFRA. For example, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm currently representing some uh, some members of the military who want a religious, you know, who who have religious objections to getting vaccinated for, for COVID. It's not a not an objection that I personally share, but you know, but they uh, they have legitimate religious reasons for wanting an exemption or from from COVID, and so they've been, among other things they've invoked, RIFRA, uh, 
um, as, a, as a basis for, for seeking to be exempted from the military's regulation that, that, requ that would otherwise require them to get the vaccine. And so they're invoking a general protection, but the effect of it in their specific case is to exempt them from, you know, from this regulation. Well, well, I would just say it's a very insightful question. I had to say I hadn't thought about it too much. It's, it's, it's known in the law as religious exemptions or accommodations. That's how, the, you know, that's how we talk about it. But I will say something maybe a little controversial, which is that the language of exemption or accommodation or protection, it's always for, how do I put it? It's for the losers. It's for people who have lost out in the culture war. And I think one of the things that maybe people among traditional religions are coming to terms with is, in a lot of ways, they are on the losing side of some of these battles, and I think maybe that explains some of the psychological um, what's the, angst that we're seeing in, the, in these culture wars, is, is one side is seeing, you know, we are using the language of the people who are now in the minority, and I, I think in that way, your question is quite insightful. It shows sort of which way the culture is going in a way. Um, I've uh, I read a particular religious scholar who uh, advocates for religious jurisprudence that avoids broad sweeping uh, decisions, you know, creating new rules and tests from the Supreme Court, and instead in religious freedom cases going for case-by-case -case resolutions that, that aren't, uh, you know, maybe explicitly aren't uh, intended to be more broadly applicable. I'm curious in cases like Fulton. Do you think that's an example of that kind of thing? And is that where the, the court may be hitting? Or is it more a kind of a biding time to get a more ripe case for a broader ruling and just your view of where the court's heading that way? Um. All right. So case by case, yes, that was Justice O'Connor. Um, she was always worried about the next case coming over the horizon and uh, was reluctant to formulate broad rules. It's very difficult for the Supreme Court, with all the attention on it, to, um, to decide a case and say, but let's be sure this is, you know, this ticket is only valid for this one train ride. Um, I think it's impossible for it. They have to articulate a principle that decides the case, and the principle, um, you know, lawyers like Gene and others will immediately take that principle and try and apply it elsewhere. With respect to Fulton, I, I think uh, I, I agree with Gene that it's less any sort of principled case by case moving as a kind of what sort of desperate rear guard action by Chief Justice Roberts to avoid uh, the courts looking uh, too political. Uh, the court seems poised to overrule Roe versus Wade, uh, overruling Smith. The court has overruled other decisions. This particular court, um, he's an incrementalist. And I, I think Fulton is more about um, appearances than it is about principle or any sort of move to a, a more case-by-case -case rather than a broader rule approach to these decisions. So uh, I think it's a, I think also a very good question. Um, Fred says it's more appearances than principles. I mean, why can't it be both, right? I think it's probably both of those things. I think that this court this Chief Justice, especially in the religion cases, wants an incremental approach. I think of Masterpiece Cake Shop as another one where, just like in Fulton, they came up with a very narrow way to decide the case and not, and not um, issue broad pronouncements. And it could be for appearances. They don't want to be seen as doing that. But also it could be for the principle they don't think it's a good idea, so uh, at least in this area. Yeah, I guess um, I think there is actually a principle that comes out of Fulton, and that is that uh, if you are, if a government is administering some regulatory regime that actually allows for exceptions, and and I think in Fulton it was not just a theoretical possibility; it was right there in the in the relevant regulations and contracts that they would allow people. Uh, implicitly, it was it was saying they would allow people to to seek exceptions, and you know, and, and exceptions could well be could well be granted. So, if you're administering that kind of that kind of a regime, uh, 
Um, you know, and, and you want to deny a religious exemption or exception uh, from your regulation, you better have a really good reason, right? And, and you're, you are going to be subject to strict scrutiny if in, in your decision to deny a religious exemption if you're administering that kind of a regime. And of course, Justice Kagan, in, in her concurrence in Fulton, said, you know, this is really a very limited ruling because, after all, the, the city of Philadelphia could fix this problem from their standpoint. The city, city could simply fix this problem by eliminating that portion of their regulation that allows them, you know, that, that expressly allows them to make, uh, to make exemptions. And so she, you know, she viewed it as a, as a fairly narrow ruling, but still the, you know, the rule to come out of the case is that if you, if you, admit, if you choose to have a system of regulation that admits for exemptions, uh, you're going to have to have a really good reason to deny a religious exemption, which, which seems to me a pretty, you know, a pretty good general rule um, to, to apply. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, the, the court and the Tandon case, which we haven't, we haven't talked about here, but that was one of the court's COVID cases, basically adopted a, a related principle that some people have, call, have called most favored nation status, that, you know, that if you, <coughs> if you give certain privileges to non-religious actors in the, in the COVID case, you know, if, you're gonna, if, if you allow casinos, um, you know, to have, uh, to have up to 75% capacity in the casino, um, you know, you're, you're pretty much going to have to do that for churches as well, um, right? You have, to, you, ha you have to give the, the church or the religious organization or the religious body sort of most favored nation treatment in your, in your regulatory regime unless you have a really good reason to treat them differently. <coughs> you know, that also is a pretty, you know, is a pretty understandable rule that's not all that difficult to apply that the court has you know, the, the, the Supreme Court has now, I think, quite clearly adopted. And, uh, and so it's not as though they're just kind of, you know, making decisions that are just, just good for this case and no others. I mean, they are, they are actually adopting, you know, I think pretty, pretty specific rules that are going to apply in a wide variety of other cases.